We are on Catherine Street. Our back is to the College of Commerce and we're facing the car park. It's a beautiful day. We can see the metal barriers between the road and the car park in front of us. Behind that, the car park itself. On the far side, a building stretches the length of the car park. It's stone on the bottom, black slate on top. Two storeys high. The metal barriers catch the light, glinting as though they're winking at us. There are brown double doors on the far side of the car park, opposite from where we're standing. There's the night, toward us, and inside it's dark. We can just about see the scattered discs of light thrown up by a disco ball. There's a crash. The disco ball has fallen from the ceiling. We can just about see it in the centre of the room behind the brown doors. It starts to roll toward us with some difficulty because it's not quite spherical after that fall. Much bigger than we might have expected. Despite being a bit battered, there is just a little more there intact. It rolls towards us, coming to rest just in front of the metal barrier. It sits there, glowing away. The brown doors slowly swing shut with a bit of creaking. It's there. Above the door, in a line, are three square indents in the building, as if cubes of concrete have been taken out of the wall. They are evenly spaced. They light up. The one on the right is two green horizontal bars, like a pause button. The one in the middle, with a big sideways green triangle, like a play button. The one on the left, with a big green circle, like the symbol for record. On the car park wall to the right, the one at the edge of the building that meets the road, you can see two shadows appear. The wall is divided into two equal sections by a dark drain going down the middle. The shadows darken and begin to move, like in the movies when they do whole days in fast motion. They converge in the middle of each path and start to swirl. Is it a trick of the light, or are they actually starting to move into the wall? We're not sure. We stare a little harder. It looks as if they've become twin vortexes, perhaps for some kind of portal to another dimension. We're all so intent on figuring out what's going on that we almost don't notice that of our three green buttons, pause and record have gone black, leaving only play, the one in the middle, still lit up. The swirling vortex on the left, which had been sucking itself deep into the building, now suddenly erupts outward ejecting something which lands in front of us. A crumpled white heap of clothing. The heap is smoking. Long tendrils rising up and curling into the air. We can't make out what it is. Or a sparkle of light. Are we sleeping? The heap begins to move. The clothes filling up and out as if they're a, be- a balloon that's being blown up. We can recognise without a shadow of a doubt a classic Elvis outfit. Bell bottoms, tight fitting jacket, raised collar, even slightly platform shoes. The outfit just stands there, hanging in the air. Now the swirling vortex on the right of the building starts to shift as well, projecting like the last one did something outward. A naked man arcs through the air, having been catapulted out of the vortex and lands miraculously in the outfit in a ridiculously cool crouch with one hand on the ground, one in the air kind of a pose. It's Elvis. We're sure of it. The hair, that unmistakable side smile, those eyes. He rises to stand, looking at us, us looking at him. He turns around and starts to run toward the brown double door. What on earth is he doing? He jumps like some kind of a superhero vaulting over the metal barrier. Jumps again 20 feet into the air, landing on the little alcove in the roof above the brown double door. He swivels around, one fist raised high in the air, and a microphone falls out of the sky to land perfectly in his hand. He nods and music starts playing. Brown double doors burst open and more disco balls start to roll out in a flood. Big ones, small ones, tiny Christmas tree decoration sized ones, loads of them. They keep pouring out of the door until they filled the entire car park. A sea of disco balls. 
Elvis seems happy now that everyone's here. We are very excited. He starts to sing and we recognise the strains of burning love. He sings with more charisma and energy than we would have thought possible. The lights in the sky and the spill of the city begin to dim. The only light now comes from the glowing disco balls, shooting their lights everywhere. The play button up on the wall goes dark and now the record button lights back up. Elvis sounds incredible. The disco balls are rolling around as if they're dancing. We start to move our hips as well. We just can't help it. The sound is so contagious. He's coming toward the end of the song. I'm just a hunk of hunk of burning love. And all of a sudden the pause button lights up. And Elvis freezes to the spot mid-word. We look to the left. Down to the end of the laneway. There's a small building there. With two boarded up doors on the bottom level. A boarded up window on the first floor in between them. And a little roof jutting over it. The window in the middle opens up and the building wails out, No! There's an awful silence. I want more! It demands. And the play button is illuminated again, unfreezing Elvis, who, without missing a beat, picks up where he left off even bigger and better than before. Now the little building is bopping along with it and the car park full of disco balls. The song goes on and the building screams out, Yeah! Elvis finishes with a flourish to say, Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. There's a puff of smoke and he's gone. We stand for a minute in the reverent silence. The disco balls start to roll back into their home behind the brown double doors. The little building to our left looks a little sad that it's over but satisfied nonetheless. We drift away, pondering the strangest feelings that we 